Hi everybody, welcome to another Future Tech podcast series. Um, it's myself, Charlie Sell, the MD of Arrows Group. Um, this podcast series is focused on STEM graduates, looking at interviewing CTOs, CIOs, senior execs across the entire technology space, asking them their thoughts, um, their, their story, ideas and advice for the STEM graduates of the universities we're paired with. So it gives me great pleasure to have Pierre Martin with me today. He's a CTO at Beacon. Beacon is a supply chain technology business, a startup business in London. Um, anyone who's seen the papers would have known it's been a, seriously backed by some quite impressive people. Um, and now it's up to, well, over to Pierre to give us a bit of a story. So hi, Pierre. Welcome to the show. Hi, Charlie. Thank you for having me. A real pleasure and, and happy to uh, share some, some insights and lessons learned with, with the people here. Yeah, fantastic. And I should say that you're, um, you're, you're cool. We're on a VC from in France, aren't we? You're on actually holiday. So this is really good of you. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, well, love to, uh, to spend time talking about uh, well, my journey and, and anything that, that can help um, students and, and people who are interested in, in learning more about STEM. Fantastic. So, well, let's dive straight into it then. And tell us a little bit more about well, who Beacon are and, and then a bit about your story. Great. Um, well, to start with Beacon, um, as you said, is a supply chain technology startup in, in London. Uh, we're actually a, a new type of uh, supply chain service, really, so to speak, uh, which combines multimodal logistics uh, with fintech, uh, data science, and a software as a service platform. Uh, and it is actually built and designed to help businesses improve their supply chain. Uh, meaning making it more uh, more efficient, more cost effective, more reliable, and and very importantly to me, more more sustainable um, over the long term. So we're, uh, as you said, a, a Series A stage company. Um, we're we're not even two years old, but have about uh, 60 employees at this point in time. And uh, as you said, backed by um, serious investors, um, so personal investment from uh, Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos, mm. uh, but also uh, Google's former CEO Eric Schmidt, uh, Uber's co-founder, and and uh, you know VC in, in Silicon Valley in, in Europe, um, including you know ABC, Expo, and, and Neo, um, among among many others. Fantastic! Wow! Yeah, and then, I mean you have a background with Amazon yourself, don't you? So your your story would be quite interesting. Uh, absolutely. Um, so before Beacon, I spent uh, five and a half years at Amazon, uh, and before that, um, another five years at, at Microsoft. Uh, and in fact, um, you know, Beacon is is um, my first startup, so to speak. Uh, although there's been a few false starts in the past, and I'm, I'm happy to speak about that also. Uh, and um, I think, you know, I probably had a more traditional um, path. In, in computer science. Um, so I did study um, engineering here in France, in fact, and then um, got a, a, well, actually I tried to stay in university as long as I possibly could. Uh, <laughs> so I ended up getting a, a doctorate in, uh, in computer engineering from, from one of the big uh, public universities in, in the United States. And, um, you know, worked actually on my doctorate for, for a few years at a very interesting, um, feel that the intersection of quantum physics and, and computer science, uh, which was not quantum computing, uh, but in fact, I was spending a lot of time uh, researching algorithms that, that simulate uh, what happens at the atomic scale in, in very um, small devices. Wow. Um, and it was a very interesting time for me because it was at the intersection between you know, computer and device architecture, so very physical, uh, silicon-based um, you know, research and development but also computer science. And I, I remember I had this clear uh, bifurcation in, in my career where I thought, well, do I want to be more of a, of a, of a silicon type of engineer or a, or a software engineer? Uh, and I realized in the process of, of doing what I was doing, I, I was developing quite a few important skills um, for, for my um, later career as a computer scientist. Um, so it was you know, building, um, I was spending time you know, designing efficient algorithms that can process large amounts of data, at scale, in a cloud environment, in a distributed environment, in, in parallel. Um, and I, you know, that's where I realized, um, you know, I can either try to, to follow Moore's law on the silicon level, or I can try to make, uh, you know, software more efficient. Uh, and this is what uh, ultimately led me to, um, to Microsoft uh, research to start my career. Uh, and then into some, some big commercial products like Xbox and, and later on 
um, Amazon. Yeah, wow. And, uh, you know, maybe to finish my story, I think Amazon was, was interesting for me um, because I, I think it's the first time I really tackled very deep algorithmic problems. So I spent um, five years at Amazon uh, building the, the software that, that computes how Amazon moves freight and, and packages um, worldwide. Uh, so, you know, we're talking billions and billions of packages uh, that, that need to be optimized. And I, I really um, enjoyed it. I think I didn't realize logistics had, had so much to offer uh, to computer scientists, which is a lot of very deep problems to solve, especially at scale. Um, and, and that's also where I, I, I grew um, as a technical leader and then an engineering manager at the end, head of engineering for, um, for a team at, um, at Amazon. Um, and I, I knew that, you know, logistics was also at that phase where it's just getting started. I think uh, Amazon is, of course, the gold standard and at the forefront of what, you know, optimal logistics and supply chain can be. Uh, but also realizing that 99% of, of other retailers and businesses have, uh, don't have access to that type of, of refinement. And, and I felt uh, passionate to, um, to develop uh, computer science in, in, in that field and, and therefore um, joined Beacon um, almost two years ago now. So fantastic. So what was the transition like from, from Microsoft to Amazon? So from going from one PLC to another, was there big cultural differences or, or anything that you learned along that way? Oh, the, the, yeah, great question. Uh, I think there's differences, of course. Uh, there's a lot of similarities. Yeah. Uh, well, even starting with their home base in, in Seattle, which is where I lived for, uh, for more than 10 years. Um, you know, the approach to technology is a bit uh, different. And, and I think what I, what I find interesting at Microsoft was more the platform approach and try to, um, of course, you know, that's this coming from, from Windows and the big um, cloud-driven businesses that, that Microsoft has. Um, while Amazon was a lot more consumer and customer-driven, right? So I think Amazon brought a lot of the thinking about understanding what the customer wants, um, but also uh, iterating very fast with the customer. So um, I think one of the things I really retain from, from Amazon's culture is uh, it's okay to fail, actually, and it's, it's encouraged to fail uh, if it helps you go fast. And, and it's totally okay to, to release uh, consumer products that are um, not working as long as you learn something in the process. Uh, and I, I think, uh, well, at my time at Microsoft, it was not the case. I think Microsoft also changed culturally quite a bit since I left more than, than, than eight years ago. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that's the other thing, isn't it? It's amazing how, how companies evolve and, and even cultures can evolve, even in the PLCs when it multinationals based on, on trends and, and different economic factors. But I guess what would be really interesting is thinking from going from Amazon to Beacon, and when you're literally, it sounds like one of the first people to, to, to join, yep. how did that transition go? What were the, what were the pros and challenges behind that? Yeah, uh, there's many, many lessons learned. Um, one, Probably I'd love to tell all the all the students uh, listening to us uh, or the future or, or recent graduates um, is that it, it's okay and, and I would encourage everyone to put uh, put yourself out there and, and try new things and, and that's really how Beacon happened uh, and I told you there was a couple of false starts in my startup career where I, I really thought I was going to start a company but I didn't uh, and I, I learned something in, in the process. Uh, one of them was um, you're going to have a good combination of, uh, you know, technical talents, uh, but also business acumen and, and investors. Uh, and if, if you don't have the three, you know, something is going to be very hard uh, in, in your journey as a startup. Yeah. So I almost joined um, a few startups in the past, which were uh, technologically exceptionally advanced, but I couldn't convince myself that the business was there. And, and ultimately that's why I, I, I didn't do it. Um, but also I, I ended up, um, you know, right before joining Beacon, I, I ended up uh, pitching an idea of a startup in FinTech, uh, which is what led me to, to London ultimately. And, and this is where I met uh, my, my um, co-founder and, and uh, now CEO of, of Beacon, uh, Fraser, who had already started um, uh, Beacon with, with his co-founder, Dimitri, at the time. And um, I was pitching, you know, a fintech business. And, and, you know, a little after, you know, pitching this, uh, Fraser 
um, it just called me and said, you know, I, I'm also starting a business and your idea is not bad, but I think mine is better. <laughs> uh, that's not probably literally not the same, the same words, but something along those lines. Uh, and it was very clear that, yeah, Beacon had that, that real good combin combination of, um, you know, good, uh, I would say, balance in the team between technical um, strength and, and, and business acumen, very strong investors. The business plan, you know, made sense. Yeah, uh, and and technology had a key role to play in there, so that's where um, I decided to join Beacon. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. So then, moving on to thinking about the emerging technologies, because it's clear. I mean, for what, what you must have seen, Microsoft, Amazon, and obviously your your passion for technology, and it sounds like data science as well. Um, what, what is your thoughts when you're when you're looking at the roadmap, the strategic roadmap for Beacon, but also the wider market? Where, where do you see the future technology moving to? Yeah, that's a good that's a good question. Uh, well, I'm I'm sure you're getting the same answer or or an answer along the same lines from many people. Um, of course, machine learning uh, and and data technologies, uh, including um, artificial intelligence, are are um, undeniably something big happening these days. Um, and and you know where is it going? You know, you hear about uh, you know the human being removed from the picture and everything fully automated. Uh, I don't think this is where it's going. Um, I think it's it's more along the lines of uh, machine augmented human. I think that that um, is the type of things we'll see um, happen over the next five or ten years and are already happening. And and you know if you look at AI um, specifically, it's it's of course very good at automating tasks that are digitally native, right? Like classifying pictures, determining what's in, in a video or, or you know, music and, and doing signal processing. Of course, uh, it, it's going to, and it's already you know, surpassed uh, human by, by many orders of magnitude. Um, but the world is still very much physical. Uh, and I think uh, it's also, you know, if you look at the world, generally speaking, it's very much an uncontrolled environment. Uh, which makes it very hard for for machines to you know to make good judgment calls uh, and react to to you know things that are not uh, seen before in an efficient way. And you know one area that I think is very very interesting is uh, the area of of deep reinforcement learning. Mm -hmm. uh, not o not only because it, it you know it's a way to um, to design um, you know some some AIs. Uh, but what I, what I retain, it's, it's been um, by having this fully unsupervised way of, of, of learning and algorithms discovering an environment and building their own interpretation of, of an environment on their own and actually uh, learning on their own what are the best strategies to follow. Um, it, it's been um, an interesting way for, uh, for actually humans to discover new strategies that they can incorporate in, in, in their work, uh, in, in, in um, you know, their um, you know, what they, they work on, generally speaking. So a good example of that, um, for instance, you may remember, um, you know, all this press a few years back about Alpha Go uh, beating the best uh, Go players on the planet. And, and uh, I think just before that uh, did the same at chess. Uh, so of course you can retain that, you know, some machines can become better than human and can automate what humans do. In reality, what happened is the machine, because it learned on its own, discovered new strategies for these games that, that professional players incorporated in their game. So in a way, I, I mean, I, I see it very much as, as human augmented um, machine uh, or, or human augmented knowledge by a machine, um, which, is, uh, which is great. And I think that's an area I would love to see uh, develop more uh, in, in the future. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. And so with me being slightly less technical, what, what we're saying then is, is humans learning from machines and machines then learning from humans. So it's almost like a never ending scale uh, cycle that's right. um, of, of learning and, and further development rather than one day machines taking over the development languages and, 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 and human interaction becoming obsolete. And, and, you know, applying that to logistics, you know, can, can a machine fully operate a, a supply chain? Of course not, right? I mean, there's very physical aspects of moving freight, for instance, yet um, you, you actually provably uh, humans are, are better at handling shapes of random 
I mean, random shapes than than a, a robot, yeah. Um, and and but also um, the environment is very uh, uncontrolled, right? So you have spikes in demand, um, and the market varies quite a bit. Uh, now, can can you run um, historical data through algorithms that will find um, possibly better strategies that that historically we we known? Yes, of course. Right? And I think that's where um, in supply chain um, specifically we can use this type of um, algorithms and data science to, to derive better knowledge, more efficiency uh, in, in the supply chain. Yeah. And, you know, you, you mentioned, uh, you know, the podcast series has been going for a little while now, and, and you're right that AI is quite a, um, a hot topic. A few people have talked to me a bit about trust and, and security around data, and, and that being, you know, that equally has to advance as much as AI and VR. What, yes. What's your thoughts around the, the trust and, and the security side of technology and whether maybe future job roles? Yes, very much. Uh, in fact, I think it's a fascinating uh, area of, of human um, machine interaction and, and uh, interface design to, that, that's really emerging in the recent years to, to build trust, right? Like as you use, uh, you know, as you use a computer program, um, simply put, how do you trust that the algorithm came up with something that's that's trustworthy? Yeah, uh, and and uh, you know there's there's very funny things that um, even at Beacon we we recognized um, and and was recognized in the travel industry before um, when we're computing prices or what is the most efficient way to ship or move freight. Uh, our our initial implementation was was very effective actually was computing in in milliseconds. And so the, the initial response of, of our um, users um, in the test phase was, well, no, that's, that can't be, right? Like you're cheating me. You, yeah. You're actually not, you're not doing any math. Like you're just spitting out results that were pre-computed, uh, which was not the case. And so we had to introduce some, some delay uh, just to, to make people believe that something was happening, right? Like there's real computation and it was completely artificial. Um, but that's a, you know, one of the examples of, of um, you know, designing good um, human uh, machine interfaces and interactions that build trust between, um, between the human and, and, and the machine or, or the algorithm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's a great one, isn't it? That you actually have to delay some of the, uh, the speed of the, the, the software to, to create that, that perception of actual manual thinking. It's, uh... Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, and security, of course, is very, very important, right? Like so many of these um, technologies rely on on uh, a lot of data. So, of course, you have to build uh, trust with your customers that uh, that data is safe with you. Um, and and you know, data security not only from data classification, but encryption and and making sure that um, um, you know networking is safe as well in in very much distributed systems and on the cloud. Uh, is, is an area, of course, I would strongly advise everyone to, to at least learn about um, to, to be more um, efficient in, in you know, today's world and, and understand what are the trade-offs you can make and what trade-offs are, are not acceptable um, for, for security. Yeah, 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 brilliant. So thinking then, you know, uh, advice for, for our listeners. So thinking about when you were finishing at university and looking and navel-gazing at where where future job roles would be. Have you, what, what words of wisdom or, or personal advice have you got for, for STEM graduates today? Um, many, uh, I would say. Um, the first one is um, learn to learn. I think it's probably the, the one I would always repeat. Um, you know, technology or technologies are, are just evolving very, very quickly. Um, and, and I think, you know, if I look at what was hot when I was a student, you know, 12 years ago, uh, is definitely not even uh, a portion of, of what uh, you would see in the, in the technical journals this day. Yeah. Um, and, and I think being able though to, to recognize new technologies and, and absorb information, learn from them and, and kind of experiment with these technologies is really um, the, the core skill here. Um, and, and, and the great news is, uh, you know, programming has become much, much easier. So it's very, uh, it's much more convenient these days to just, um, you know, spin up a, a small prototype, um, including, uh, you know, machine learning packages and, and do some, some prototyping with, uh, with data. 
uh, than it would have been um, many years ago. Yeah. So uh, I would strongly encourage anyone to, to just carve out time uh, in your day to learn uh, and to, to experiment and prototype with things so you can keep up with, with what's going on. Yeah. Um, I would say, uh, and, and connected to learning, I think curiosity is, is, um, is also probably the, the, the one thing I would advise everyone to, to be proactive about. Uh, and by curiosity, I mean, um, you know, trying to break the black box, trying to understand how things work, not in, not in your direct uh, line of work or industry, but, but, but sometimes outside of your industry. And um, I'll give you a few examples, for instance, in logistics, um, you know, a lot of the patterns that you see are patterns that, that arise in other industries as well, right? So for instance, um, you know, scheduling problems around, um, you know, picking up and delivering uh, packages, uh, capacity allocation, like how do you distribute a, you know, a, a, a mass of freight and packages to uh, finite resources like delivery vans, and, and, and things like that um, have a lot of similarities with with class of algorithms you find in um, you know in compilers and designing um, you know scheduling and capacity allocation in compilers. So understanding how these things work and how they can apply to other industries is really a good source of of um, innovation. Mm -hmm. um, so so you know being being curious about about the world and, and technology around you and understanding how it works. Uh, is a very good way to, to, to maybe think more innovatively in your own uh, line of work. Yeah. I would say uh, just learn and, and, and be curious is probably a very important thing for, for any engineer and, and, and STEM graduates. Yeah. Um, I would maybe my last advice would be, um, you know, spend time on the fundamentals, um, you know, cloud computing um, and data is here, of course, to, to, to stay. Uh, and as I told you, it's very easy to write a prototype, uh, and it's probably 5% of the time to get something functionally working in one case. Uh, but the hard work is to make it a, a production system, right? a, a real product that's being used by, by users. And, and you know, 95% of the work is, is just sweat and repetitive work, and, and it's understanding you know, deployments, continuous integration, continuous deployments, testing, uh, writing maintainable codes, um, the type of things that, you know, m some people may consider less fun, but this is such a critical skill in your, in your career to, to be able to build, um, you know, production level systems. And, and I think, don't discount that. You may be, you know, the smartest um, computer scientist, very good at math and, and excellent at, at writing efficient algorithms. If you don't understand how to bring those to production, then, then it's just research. It's not building products. Yeah, yeah, and that last point I think is really prevalent, isn't it? That the the switch from academia, from from a, from understanding the research or the theory, through to actually how to deliver something, put it through to production, and and um, almost the street smart smarts even of of what you need to do to get things live. Um, you know, it's, it's it's fascinating in its own topic. So, well, Pierre, thank you. Well, that that was really interesting. It's great to see someone who. I've seen both sides of the coin now from, from the, the, the multinational through to startups and the lessons you've learned there. And um, again, I, I couldn't agree with you more around the, the learn to learn, not being afraid to, to fail. And it's great that Amazon sort of underpinned that for you as well. That, that's a lovely thing to hear. And then, yeah, the, the, the ability for any graduate to be able to turn theory into practicality and learn the fundamentals, you know, three really good points there. So. Yeah, thank you. And, and I couldn't stress more the, 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 the just don't be afraid to fail. I think uh, anyone can do it. And, and, you know, if you believe you can do it, that's, that's half of the job done. Yeah. Uh, but if you don't, you'll never try to build and create anything. So I think that's just uh, that's maybe it. lesson number one is don't be afraid to experiment and, and fail. Um, that's how you'll learn how to do it um, the right way the next time. And that's great to hear that from someone like yourself who's done so well that, that you know, that really should be the mindset from across all levels, shouldn't it? Whether you are running a business all the way through to, to starting your career. So thank you. Well, look, that's another series of uh, another episode of the Future Tech podcast series. Um, it's going to be on YouTube, Spotify and the career pages of all the universities that we're pairing up with. Um, once again, a big thank you to Pierre from Beacon. Thank you, Charlie.
and um, until the next episode. So goodbye all.